All right, well, let's begin class here. This will be uh, class number five of our series on Creation Science 102. We're up to the part about dinosaurs and are they mentioned in the Bible. Before you take each of these classes by video, by the way, you should take the quiz from the previous class. So this will be uh, quiz number three that you should have on uh, from quiz number four from the last, uh, last class we just took. Okay, let's talk about dinosaurs. Are they mentioned in the Bible? Well, not by the word dinosaur, because the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. In the Bible, at least the King James Version, was written in 1611, which is before 1841. So, of course, they didn't use the word dinosaur. They used the word dragons. And, yes, they are mentioned in the Bible. If you read the book of Job, Job's interesting. It's got 42 chapters. It's pretty much dead center in the Bible. Uh, most people that have studied this will say probably the book of Job was written, or at least took place, shortly after the flood in the days of Noah. The, the logic for this saying that Job is probably actually the oldest book in the Bible. The rest of it, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books is called the Pentateuch. They were actually assembled. Uh, Genesis was assembled by Moses. He's the editor. And then he's the author of the next four. And since Moses lived right about here, a thousand years after the flood, uh, the books that Moses wrote are not considered to be the oldest books in the Bible, even though they deal with the oldest time frame. You know, Genesis deals with the creation. But by the time the book of Genesis is over, you're clear up to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and just about to Moses, actually, by the time the book of Genesis. So Genesis covers all of this part of history. And then Exodus is when they left, you know, they exited from uh, Egypt uh, involuntarily. But uh, they... That's when Moses led them out. So this is the time when Moses lived, right about here. 500 years later, we get to King Solomon, King David, uh, King Saul. If it's easy to remember, each of those guys was king for 40 years. King Saul for 40 years, and then King David, and then King Solomon. But that all took place right about 1000 B.C. is when the, really they started having kings. Before that time, they had judges. For 350 years, they were ruled by judges, and that would fit right in here in history. So during the time of Moses... Uh, Moses brought, got the law from God and all this kind of stuff. And for the rest of the Bible, it, it refers back to the law. In the book of Job, there are no references to the law. Not the Ten Commandments or the law of God. So that's one of the reasons some people think it had to take place before Moses gave the law. Another, though, a, a counter-argument to that is that it talks about Job as being the richest man in the East, probably from China or some region like he's probably a Chinaman, Job was. And because... The people right after the flood were still living to be 400 years old. If you remember that from the chart, you know, from the back of your seminar notebook, they're still living to be over 400. And because Job had 10 grown kids, all married, off on their own, and they all died when the house crashed in on them, and Job then lived long enough after that to have 10 more kids and see his great-great-grandkids, probably he was living a long time in order for that to be accomplished. So most people think Job was one of those guys during this time frame in, in history when people were living to be 400, you know, three or 400 years old. Most Bible scholars put the book of Job as sometime around similar to the time of Abraham, even though this probably took place in the east in China. Anyway, Job 1.1. 1, 1. Bible says, There was a man in the land of Uz. I have no idea where Uz is. Maybe somebody knows, okay? Uh, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. The word eschewed is an old English word that means he hated. He hated evil. And unto him were born seven sons and three daughters. And his substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Here's the clue that tells us Job was in the East, possibly China or India or, you know, who knows, one of those eastern countries, at least east from where the Bible was written or Bible references took place. So east of there would be probably one of those countries. So the messenger came in Job, 40, in Job 1, 14, and said, Hey, guess what, Job? The oxen were plowing and the asses beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away and slew all the servants, and I'm the only one who survived. Job's having a bad day, okay? How many uh, oxen did he lose? 500 yoke of oxen, probably two to a yoke, that means he just lost a 1,000 cows. Now, today, a cow, at least here in the year 2000 or so, the cow is worth about a 1,000 bucks. He lost a 1,000 of them. That's a million dollars. That's just from the cows he lost. Then it tells us, also, they took all the asses. Now, that's, uh, let's see, 500 she-asses, donkeys, 
I don't know what they're worth today. They wouldn't be worth nothing to me. I wouldn't want one, but you know, some people want these things, and so they're worth you know several hundred dollars apiece. So Job's you know having a rough time. Then another servant comes and says, "By the way, the fire of God fell and burned up all your sheep and killed all the servants and consumed them. And the Chaldeans came and stole all your camels." So Job lost all of his sheep and all of his camels. He had seven thousand sheep. Lost them all. Ask a sheep farmer what a sheep is worth, but you know, Job lost an awful lot of money here in just a few minutes. Then he said, by the way, your sons and your daughters were all killed when the house collapsed on them. The wind came, <laughs> knocked the house down, and they're all dead. So to top off his great financial loss, he just lost his entire family. And he says, by the way, and then of course, you know, read the whole story in the book of Job, how Job, uh, the, the Satan was doing this to Job. But Job, Satan went to the Lord, and after Job did not curse God, you know, God took everything away, and then God says, okay, you can touch him, you can touch his flesh, but you can't kill him. So jo Satan gave Job boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. A boil is like the world's worst zit, extremely painful to touch, and if you're completely covered in them, including your feet, you, you can't get the pressure off. No matter how you sit or stand or lay down, there's pressure on some of them someplace. One of the tortures they did in China to the Christians was they would take a red-hot pliers, dip it in the fire, you know, stick it in the fire to get it hot, and then they would pinch the person and pull and twist a piece, off, twist a piece of skin off. And they would do it in seven different places on their body every day, different places. You just can't find a comfortable place to lay down when you got a piece of skin pulled off by red-hot pliers. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs and see some of the tortures they did, it's just unreal. By the way, somebody just calculated, I just read the article uh, yesterday, I forget when it was recently, that there probably have been more Christians killed in the last 10 years in different parts of the world than in all of human history combined. The persecution is going like crazy in other countries like Africa, India, uh, Pakistan. They're killing Christians. Uh, persecution is really running rampant right now, and it's going to get, it just hasn't reached America yet is the only problem. So in Job chapter 2, it says that Satan gave Job boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And to top it off, his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you give up on serving God? Now, a fellow can take a lot, you know, when his, he can, he can take a financial loss and he can, you know, his kids can die and he can handle that. But boy, when your wife turns against you, that's just pretty hard to handle. That's just about the last straw. You know, you at least want your wife to, to be uh, loyal and... She said, why don't you just give up serving God? And Satan has gotten many men to quit serving God because their wife said, why don't you just quit serving God? Why don't you quit going to church all the time, quit tithing? You see, so many women, they go to the preacher and say, preacher, pray for my husband. You know, he's out at the bar every night drinking and all this. And would you pray for my husband? Get him saved. So the preacher prays and he works on the husband and gets him converted, gets the husband to church. And then the husband spends all his time at the church, you know, working on a bus route or driving a you know, Sunday school bus or working in a Sunday school class. And... And then the wife gets mad because, well, he's never home anymore. He's always working at the church. <laughs> well, you idiot. You ought to be thankful he's at the church instead of at the bar, you know. But they don't seem to get the picture sometimes. Anyway, so the Bible says Job's four friends came to visit him. How long they were there, nobody knows, but it was quite a while because at least seven days they sat there in the ashes and said nothing. If you can get a friend who can just be there when you've had tragedy and keep his mouth shut, just look. I'm having a hard time. Just sit there and don't say nothing. <laughs> Those kind are very rare. Everybody wants to come give advice instead. But Job's friends in the East came and they heard about Job's tragedy and came and they sat and didn't say a word for seven days. They saw Job's great misery. I tell in my seminar, one of those guys was the shortest man mentioned in the Bible. That's Bildad the shoe height. That's an English play on words, of course. That's pretty short, you know, high as a shoe, shoe height. Well, these four guys came and they talked to Job for 35 chapters. Most of the book of Job is these guys talking to Job, explaining to him why everything went wrong. Now, you have to be very careful taking a doctrine from the book of Job. And I'm going to be careful how I phrase this. But the Bible is the Word of God, but it contains many lies. It will accurately record what Job's four friends said, but that doesn't mean what they said was right. The Bible accurately records things that the devil said. But it doesn't mean it's right. So some people read through the book of Job, you know, where it say something like the dead don't know anything. Jehovah's Witness gets some of their doctrine from the book of Job. See, the Bible says when you die, you go to the grave and that's it. Well, who said that? 
You know, you read the whole chapter and you find out it's one of Job's four friends talking. So you've got to say, oh, wait a minute. Yes, the Bible says that, but it's not true. Because it's God accurately recorded what this guy said, but what this guy said was not true. So somebody says, do you believe everything in the Bible? I say, yes. However, that doesn't mean it's all true. I believe that Bildad said that. Now, what he said wasn't right, but I believe he said that. Okay, the Bible recorded it for us accurately. So you've got to be real careful, especially in those, those chapters where these four guys are talking. I'd be cautious about getting any Bible doctrine out of those four chapters. Anyway, uh, Job uh, had tragedy. Everything went wrong. Uh, he'd lost everything. And so his friends came and gave the typical, you know, typical Baptist response. And I'm independent Baptist, by the way. But they said, oh, Job, you, something's going wrong, huh? Well, we know why. You must ascend. And this is a very common problem people have. They assume tragedy means you disobeyed God. We've got a videotape called The Bible and Health in our series where we deal with, uh, among other things on that tape, four reasons why there are problems in this world. Why is there suffering? When you see somebody suffering, you say, why? Well, we, we tend to think that all suffering is because of disobedience to God, and that's just simply not true. Now, that is the cause of some suffering. Some suffering is because of your willful disobedience to common sense laws of nature. I mean, if you stand up on the roof and jump off head first into the concrete, your head's going to hurt. And that's not God's fault. <laughs> it's your fault, okay? If you go out drinking and you get, you get drunk and you get in a car wreck and you get your arm cut off, well, that's not, that's not God's fault. That's just flat stupid. I mean, you did it yourself. And I've got scars on my body from just plain dumb stuff that I've done through the years, and probably you all do too. Uh, it's, and you, we can't blame anybody but ourselves. Some suffering is just because we're just living a human body and it's prone to suffering. Jesus got tired, didn't he? Laid down in the ship and went to sleep. He was thirsty on the cross. He said, I thirst. What does that mean? He was, because he's suffering, he's, he's sinful? No. Some suffering is just natural suffering. I mean, it just comes with being human. If there, see, you've got to figure out, we're eventually going to die. So it's not always God's will for you to be in, you know, perfect health. These guys run around preaching, you know, you send me 20 bucks and I'll pray that God will heal you of all your diseases. Or, you know, you've got to plant, plant that seed faith, you know. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so crazy, these guys, things these guys say on TV. You know, you've got to plant that seed of faith. Send $20. Well, how come I've got to plant my seed in your garden? Why don't you plant your 20 bucks in my garden and let's see how it does, you know. <laughs> Try it that way instead. Well, they don't seem to see it that way. And their garden is blooming real well, by the way. Um, but some people get this attitude that all suffering is because of sin, and that's just simply not true. Uh, Job, finally, after these guys have been talking to him now for 35 chapters, it went on and on for 35, but in chapter 31, Job's about had enough with his friends. He said, I wish the Lord would answer me. Why did this happen to me? And you know, as much tragedy as there is in this world, oftentimes you get to that point where you wonder, why did this happen to me? Why, God, why are you doing this? Like my wife and her back, you know, the sacrum and tailbone, the vertebrae are crushed or uh, the uh, disc is desiccated and just excruciating pain constantly for seven and a half months now. Can't sit, can't lay down. It's just like, God, why? Well, you don't always have to know. You don't have to always know why things happen. Job said, why did this happen? Lord, what are you doing? Would you please answer me? Of course, Job did not know about Romans 8, 28. It hadn't been written yet, but it was coming. The Bible says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. Now, this is one of those conditional promises in God's Word. Some promises are unconditional. Other promises are conditional. I did that with my kids. You know, I'm gonna, you're my son, so I'm going to love you unconditionally. However, if you clean up your room and, you know, make your bed and take out the garbage and do this, then I will take you to Dairy Queen and get an ice cream. That's a conditional promise. I will do something if you will do something. Romans 8.28 is one of those conditional promises that says everything that happens to you will work together for good. If you love God, to, it's only to those who love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, the verse does not say everything that happens is good. It says it'll work together for good. And the illustration I use is, have you ever been hungry? Anybody here ever been hungry before? Well, as you come to my house, you knock on the door. Brother Hovind, I'm hungry. A teenager, he's hungry all the time, right? Say, Brother Hovind, I'm hungry. I said, man, come on in. I'm going to fix you up. I'm going to 
Boy, just open your mouth here. I got a cup of flour. Eat that. He said, ugh, a cup of flour? That wouldn't taste too good, would it? Well, how about a teaspoon of salt? You want a teaspoon of salt? Would that taste good? Yeah. No. How about baking soda? Let's pour that down your throat. See how that tastes. No. Well, how about a half a cup of Crisco? Anybody like to drink a half a cup of Crisco? How about a cup of buttermilk? Some people drink that stuff. I just can't bring myself to drink it. How about let's mix them all together and make biscuits? Oh, well, now we're talking. See, the individual ingredients taste lousy, but they work together for good. If you read through just about any cake mixture or recipe or something, you'll find out the individual ingredients would not taste very good. But they will work together for good. And that's what God promised. He promised all things will work together for good if you love God. Sometimes bad things happen, at least it seems for the moment that it's bad, and you say, God, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to do what's right. Why did you let this happen? But as then long as you go, go along through life longer and longer, you realize, wow, that was really good. I remember we tried awful hard to get, borrow the money to buy a brand new trailer when we first got married. We wanted to get a brand new motor, mobile home. And it just didn't work out. And I said, God, why didn't you let this work out? Well, of course, I found out if we had bought that brand new mobile home, then five years later, we would have lost, you know, $10,000 when we went to sell it. It depreciates like a car. So instead, God just shut the door. We were trying to serve God, and we just thought like doors were being shut. Oh, God, why would you do this? Don't you love us? Don't you want us to have this? And he's trying to say from heaven, no, I don't want you to have that. I got something else better for you. And so you just got to keep serving God. And sometimes it takes a while to see the crop come in. You know, you plant the seeds and you stand there and watch the dirt for a while and you'll get discouraged. Plant the seeds and then get busy and go do something else and you'll be, the, the crop will come in, okay? You just keep doing what's right. Oh, it's hard, though, to keep your heart right with God because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. So finally, in Job chapter 38. Now let's get the picture here. This is taking place about... You know, a few hundred years after the flood, probably, sometime in this time frame. Job has been sitting there listening to his friends, arguing with his friends for 35 chapters, probably for several days. Now, the way they did it back then was very different than the way we do it here in America today. We always interrupt each other. Somebody will make a statement, and then somebody else says, no, and they stop right in the middle of the sentence and interrupt. What they did here in the book of Job, one of the guys like Bildad or Eliphaz or Zophar, they'll, they'll talk for two or three chapters. Everybody sits there quietly and listens. While the guy talks on and on and on, then when it's the next guy's turn, he gives his response. I went through my Bible and added up how many verses each of those guys spoke. And I've got the total in one of my old Bibles. It's falling apart now. But it was interesting to see Job spoke quite a bit in there. And Eliphaz and Bildad and so far, and later on Elihu, the last guy, the fourth guy, he didn't say nothing until he got about to chapter oh, 32, I think. Elihu finally speaks up. One of the guys, uh, I forget which one now, but one of Job's friends said, I know I'm telling the truth because I saw a vision. In the night, you know, my hair stood on end and I saw this vision, and so I know I'm telling you the truth. I get real nervous when I get these guys telling me, you know, they got a vision from God about God's will for my life. <laughs> right away, red flags go up. They say, Wait a minute. God can talk to me just fine, you know. He doesn't need to give you some kind of vision in the night. What the guy was trying to say is, I've had a superior spiritual experience. Therefore, I'm better than you spiritually. And we get that same thing happens today in Christianity where you get some person that says, you know, I spoke in tongues or I did this or I did something else and therefore, I'm better than you are spiritually. That's what they're implying. And some of them, of course, really honestly believe that. You know, they believe they are better than you because of some experience they had. And that would go off into a long discussion, uh, which, which I'm not afraid to get into. We just don't have time right now. Job answered the Lord. I'm sorry, Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job. Out of the whirlwind. Now, God's going to speak to Job. There was a fellow in the Bible who had two sons, Jacob and Esau. How many remember that story about Jacob and Esau? Isaac, the old man, is blind, and he's, he's old and he's dying. And he calls his son Esau in. He says, Esau, I want you to go catch a deer, kill it, and uh, make me some venison, and I'm going to give you the blessing before I die. You all know that story. Esau takes off to go get a deer. Well, the mother heard this and called the other son, Jacob, and said, Hey, come here, Jacob. Go get some sheep. Go get two sheep. I want you to kill them. We're going to 
Now, take the wool off of one. I'm going to cover the back of your hand since your brother's hairy and you're not hairy. I'm going to cover the back of your neck in case your father decides to feel you. And I'm going to cook the venison or cook the uh, lamb to make it taste as much like venison as I can. And you know the story. They brought the lamb in, and the dad said, "Let me. You sound like uh, you sound like Jacob, but you uh, you feel like Esau." The dad got in trouble because he went by the feeling instead of by the voice. And we get the same thing in Christianity today. We've got an awful lot of people going by the feeling instead of by the word. The question is, what does the word say? I was in a big argument this week, uh, two days ago in California, with uh, one fellow who says, you know, this, this Dr. Hugh Ross, who's a very nice man, you know, he says, you just, he has to be right. He's such a nice guy, you know. I said, no, wait a minute. You don't go by feeling. You don't go by what a nice guy he is. You go by what does the word say. And if somebody tells me it's a local flood in the days of Noah, and my Bible says it was a worldwide flood, I'm going to go by what the Bible says, and I don't care how nice the guy is. It doesn't matter. And I don't care if somebody has a feeling. You get in trouble when you go by feelings. You have to go by thus saith the Lord. What does the word say? And anyway... That was uh, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar's problem. They kept going by their feelings, which is a big problem in Christianity today when you get into this psychological uh, uh, analyzing people's problems psychologically instead of scripturally. And I'm not against, you know, psychology. I minored in that in college. But we got an awful lot of these guys going around trying to solve everybody's problems with biblical psychology. And I just think you ought to put up some cautions and say, wait a minute, let's just stick exactly with the Bible. What does this book say? Go by the word. Okay. So the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Now, if a tornado ever starts talking to me, I'm going to pay attention. And the Lord said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? That phrase, darkeneth counsel. He tries to hide good advice. There's some good advice, and he's trying to hide it. Words without knowledge. Boy, we've got plenty of that going around the world today. A lot of people speaking words, but they don't know what they're talking about. God said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? This is the first question of, by my count, 84. Henry Morris counts it and thinks there are 77 questions. I count, think there's 84. It kind of depends how you want to divide them. But there's over 70, possibly as many as 84 questions in the next four chapters as God speaks to Job. The four chapters where God spoke to Job or Job chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41. In those four chapters, Job has one very brief interruption where he says, Lord, I'm going to put my hand on my mouth. I've been talking, but I shouldn't have said a word. And God goes on. Basically, for four chapters, God is speaking to Job, starting in chapter 38, and God asks Job questions. Who remembers? About how many questions did God ask Job? 84. That's my count, anyway. 84 questions God asked Job. Here's the first one. God said, where were you <clears throat> when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, this is a fascinating verse because what are the foundations of the earth? There are those who think that when God first made the world, he made uh, the crust of the earth had foundations to it. There's, um, I believe it's Baumgartner, the physicist, has done intensive research on the, what, you know, from seismograph, seismograph uh, readings. When you have an earthquake, it sends out a wave through the earth. They can tell by the wave how thick the crust of the earth is <clears throat> by different readings they get in different parts of the, of the country. And so it appears like under the continents there are almost like pillars that go way down deep where it's very different density to the material. And some people think there really are foundations, you know, going way down deep into the earth, foundations to the, to the continents. Oceanic crust, under the oceans the crust is only three to five miles thick. Under the continents, it's at least 30 miles thick and maybe even much more than that. So there appear to be actually foundations to the earth. Now, <clears throat> if you read in the next few verses here about the uh, angels shouted for joy when they saw God lay the foundations of the earth. Some have used this to argue that the angels were created before the earth, before the creation 6,000 years ago. That's not what it says. The foundations of the earth were probably laid on the second or third day, possibly second day. And so the angels must have been created on the first or second day. The Bible doesn't tell us when they were created. But the angels were probably created first or second day, and then they got to see the rest of the creation. Now, the angels and Satan and Lucifer and all that stuff is not from before uh, the creation. We went over that in an earlier session. Okay, Job doesn't answer the question, so God asked him another question. 
declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest. In other words, who figured out the measurements of the earth? That's an amazing verse that you can go for hours on. The measurements of the earth are absolutely perfect for human life. If the earth were more massive, gravity would be stronger. It'd be harder to get up. It'd be harder to do everything. If the earth were not as massive, gravity would be less. If the earth were spinning faster, our days would be different. If it was spinning slower, you would cook in the daytime and freeze at the nighttime. That's the problem the moon has. The moon is spinning so slow, it takes it almost a full month to turn around one time. Which means you're in the sun for 14 days straight. It gets up to 250 degrees, way past the boiling point of water, Fahrenheit. And at night, it gets extremely cold, down about 100 and some below zero Fahrenheit, because it's dark for 14 days. If the earth were spinning slower or faster, it would greatly affect life on earth. If the atmosphere weren't as thick, if there weren't an ozone layer, and there are entire books written about how the earth was designed for human life. It's just designed to support life here. So God laid the measures thereof. It's got exactly the right density of material, exactly the right uh, gravitational pull. Now, the moon is very different. The moon is about 30% silica, I understand, which is very highly reflective. When they brought back lunar soil in 1969 and analyzed it, somebody made the comment, you know, this is extremely reflective material. It looks like the moon was designed to reflect light. I could have told him that without going up there to get a piece of it. Yeah, it was designed to reflect light. And probably when God first made it, it didn't have all the craters. So it would have reflected light much better, like a crystal ball or something up there. And then possibly either, either at the curse, or my theory is that probably at the time of the flood, an ice meteor came flying through our solar system. And we cover that on video or seminar part six, this the Hovind theory. If a meteor came, an ice meteor came through the solar system, that would pieces of it would break apart and fragment and hit the planets. Mercury has craters all over it. The moon has craters all over it. And that probably is what started the flood and froze the mammoth standing up. You can cover, we'll get into that in video number six. In the class, it'll be about 18 years till we get there <coughs> at the rate we're going. Okay. The measures of the earth. It is perfectly designed for human life. Job doesn't answer any of these questions. God keeps asking him question after question. Job's not saying a word. We come to verse 16. And the Lord said, Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Now you realize this was written back shortly after the flood, probably, in the first, you know, 500 years for sure. And God said, Job, have you entered into the springs of the sea? Well, nobody knew there were springs in the sea until 1977. Here we've got a scientific discovery in the last 30 years that God told us about over 4,000 years ago. Science is very slowly catching up with a few parts of the Bible. I don't think they're ever going to catch up with the whole thing, but they've caught up with just a few parts. There are actually springs in the sea. They go down to the real deep parts of the ocean, and there are vents. Sometimes it's, it's bubbling up uh, boiling hot water. Sometimes it's clear water. Oftentimes it is fresh water. You have fresh water vents coming in the bottom of a saltwater ocean. When I was in Hawaii uh, last week, we got a helicopter and... Uh, one of those tour things, you know, you pay them 80 bucks and you fly around. They flew over the one of the uh, areas of the island where uh, Gomer Pyle has his house. Uh, it's for sale, by the way, five and a half million if you want to buy uh, Gomer Pyle's house on the island near the town of uh, Hana, H-A-N-A. But in that area, you notice it's it's lava everywhere from a volcano. Out of the out of the, there's a cliff of lava and there's waterfalls just shooting out of the side of the of the lava. It rains on top of the mountain. The, the mountain is so porous, it soaks up all the water, finds a channel, and comes squirting out someplace else. I bet we saw 500 waterfalls in that just quick tour with the helicopter around that island. Waterfalls everywhere. And they weren't all just like a stream running and falling over a cliff. They're just starting in the middle of a cliff and shooting out. This is similar to probably what's happening at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, somehow there are possibly still interconnected channels or uh, caverns under the, in, within the crust of the earth. Walt Brown has uh, done great research on this, on the what's called the hydroplate theory. If you don't have the book In the Beginning by Walt Brown, it's a tremendous book. We have it in our bookstore out here. 
That is an awesome book. Now, I disagree with Walt Brown on a couple of minor things. He does not think there was a canopy above, and I, I'm convinced there was, and we can discuss that all day. But um, he's got great research on the hydroplate theory, how that when God first made the earth, there was a layer of rock for Adam and Eve to live on, you know, the dirt, probably 10 or 20 miles thick. And then under that was interconnected chambers of water. And that water under the crust of the earth, it's mentioned in Psalm 136, it's mentioned in Psalm 24, how the earth was founded upon the seas. That water is probably what came shooting out to the surface at the time of the flood. Before the flood, most of the water that is now in the oceans was under the crust of the earth, stored in these chambers. They came shooting up to the surface, and the Bible has numerous references to that. And if you get the Defender's Bible by Henry Morris, you can get that through our bookstore on our website. Tremendous Bible with... Uh, footnotes on all sorts of interesting things. Henry Morris, the president of Institute for Creation Research uh, for many years. He's got a lot of stuff on, on that topic there. Okay. There are springs in the sea. Possibly there are still interconnected channels within the crust of the earth, like a honeycomb, like we have caves all over. Missouri, just Missouri alone, has 5,000 caves. Many have never been explored. I've, I've been in so many caves. I like going spelunking, as they call it. You know, I was in a cave once in Tennessee, when I saw the opening to the cave, I said, we're not going in there, are we? And Kurt Wise, who's a brilliant man, teacher at uh, Bryan College, he was with me. He said, yeah, let's go in. I've heard it's a really neat cave. You had to decide when you went in the cave, the opening was about as wide as this room and about that high. It was probably as... We, we had to, you had to decide when you, got, when you started, sli you had to slide through. You had to decide if you wanted your face to the left or your face to the right because you couldn't turn your head over as you went through. It was that tight. So I put my face down and I started sliding through this mud, you know, and slid about, oh, had, you know, scooted about 20 feet. Finally, you come out and you're in this huge room. And we spent the rest of the day with our flashlights going around exploring this gorgeous cave. But that was the opening, <laughs> that eye and that wide. But then we had to, of course, slide back out to get out of the cave. And then later that day, we went to the uh, Hardy's restaurant or something. We're standing there with just mud, you know, dried mud, caked on both sides of us. <laughs> There's two PhDs standing here ordering a hamburger, and the lady's looking at us, looking at us like, "What's the, what, where did you guys come from, anyway? <laughs> I thought, I wonder what's going through her mind right now. Just give me the hamburger, would you, lady? So there are caves all over the world, <clears throat> is the point. There are probably under, within the crust of the earth, even under the ocean, caves, cavern systems. Most of this is probably left, from, left behind from the time of the flood when the pre-flood caverns under the crust of the earth, they used to hold all the water, collapsed. Many of them would collapse, but not totally. There would be pockets of water trapped. Uh, this possibly still interconnected, and there are springs of water shooting up in the sea. And that could be an entire study just on that topic. Okay, last thing we'll talk about before the break. In Job chapter 38, verse 19, God said, Where is the way where light dwelleth? That's an interesting passage because light doesn't stay in a place. It's in a way. It's always moving. It was just this year that they figured out a way to slow light down. Some professors at Harvard University, Dr. Howe, a Danish professor, slowed light down to one mile per hour. And uh, last month, wasn't it, where the uh, newspaper articles came out that said they've been able to speed light up to 300 times the speed of light. We cover that on video number seven. We got all the documentation on that when you get into, you know, because crit critics will say, if the stars are 10 billion light years away, the universe must be 10 billion years old. Well, there's a lot of problems with a statement like that. You can't measure 10 billion light years away, first of all. You can only measure maybe 20 to 100 light years max. Secondly, we don't know that the speed of light's always been a constant. Matter of fact, we now know that it hasn't. It isn't a constant. The speed of light is variable. Einstein's theory was the speed of light is constant and time changes. No, well, maybe so. But maybe Albert was wrong. Maybe time is the constant and the speed of light changes. It appears right now that he was wrong, at least on that point. He's a brilliant man. I'm certainly not as smart as he is. But it, certainly we know that the speed of light is not a constant. And the third point I make on the starlight question is, if God can make a full-grown man and a full-grown woman in a full-grown garden, he can make stars and light at the same time. A full-grown universe. So it's not a problem at all. So this is neat how that light dwells in a way. It's always moving. He didn't say, what is the, where is the place where light dwells? Because light doesn't stay in a place. 
If we shut the lights off in this room right now, there's 10 lights in here, 12, 14 lights, putting off light, okay? And this gets into a long discussion, which we won't get into here. There are two different words for light in the Hebrew language and only one in the English. I would say that is a light, but it produces light. We only have one word. They have two words. Or, O-R is the Hebrew word, it's the English equivalent of the Hebrew word, which means um, the light itself. And M-A-O-R, I believe, is the word for the light source. So God made the light in Genesis chapter 1, the first few verses. Later on, he made the light source. Two different Hebrew words. Carefully distinguished there. Fascinating footnotes on that in the Defender's Bible. Henry Morris's uh, stuff right here. So light doesn't stay in a place. It's in a way. It would have been scientifically inaccurate for God to say, where is the place where light dwells? Because light doesn't dwell in a place. Light is in a way. It's always moving. Now, nobody understands what light is, and I taught physics for years, I'm telling you, as far as I know, nobody knows what light is. We know what it does, we can do things with it, but we don't know what it is. Is it a wave or a, part, a particle or a photon? Those don't really describe what it is. And so if you get an answer to that, I'd love to hear it. Okay, when we get back, we'll talk more about some other scientific things stated in the book of Job 4,000 years ago, before modern man ever knew about it. Take up that kind of stuff after the break. In Job 38, uh, verse 4, the Lord said, By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Now, that's an amazing verse. That's talking about weather patterns. The Bible is telling us here that the light causes the wind. Now, the weatherman didn't understand that, as far as I know, until just really the last hundred years or so. Sunlight shines on the ground and heats it up, makes the air expand above the ground. Expanding air pushes out. Contracting air will pull in. So as ground cools, the air above it is going to cool, and it's going to make the wind go that direction, toward that area, whereas as the ground gets hot, it's going to expand, and the wind will go away from that area. So the wind patterns are driven by the light. Exactly what God said 4,000 years ago. Now, we're too far here in Pensacola to feel, where I'm at at least, six miles from the beach. We don't feel the sea breeze. But people that live right on the beach will tell you, in the daytime, the wind blows one direction. At nighttime, it blows the other direction. This is because land and water cool at different rates, and they absorb heat at different rates. In the daytime, the dirt is going to absorb heat faster than the water. So the land will get hot quicker if it's sunny, that causes the air to rise, and the wind blows in off the water. You get an onshore breeze in the daytime, normally. At night, the ground cools off faster than the water, and so you get an offshore breeze at night. Usually, about sunrise or sunset, you have neither one. No breeze at all. Of course, there's always exceptions to this, but it's kind of a, kind of a general rule. If you want to see the gulf out here, flat calm, no waves at all, or very few waves, go out at sun, just about sundown or just about sun up, and you should find a time where there's very few, very few waves, very little wind going on. See, the wind causes, uh, or the light causes the wind patterns, and God said that a long time ago. God said in Job 38, Canst thou send lightnings? Can you imagine if you had the power to send lightning? Boy, it's a good thing I can't. How many of you can think of somebody that's lucky to be alive because you can't send the lightnings? <laughs> think of several, right? God's saying to Job, can you send the lightnings? You know, one lightning bolt, one of the big ones, can produce enough electricity to light the whole United States for hours. There's an awful lot of energy in this lightning. And if we could just figure out a way to harness that, boy, you'd be, you'd be rich. If you could, I've been hit by lightning once. I hope it never happens again. I was climbing down an aluminum ladder. We were fixing the roof up in Arkansas for my father-in-law and uh, the storm, putting a new roof on. storm was blowing in, so we just threw some tarps over it and I, you know, said, get off the roof quick. I'm climbing down the ladder, just about to touch ground, and lightning hit the ladder, as far as we can figure out. Went through the ladder, and part of it through me, jumped through my right leg into the mud puddle under me, knocked me up in the air about two feet. I fell down and broke my elbow on a rock when I hit. And every fiber in my body was just alert, like, wow, I'm really alert, you know, very high voltage, and I probably did not get the full 
you know, strike of the lightning, but it hit, you know, right there. To, people have been killed by lightning. There's one guy who's been hit seven times and survived. He's in Guinness Book of World Records. You know, one time it hit him on top of the head, knocked a hole in his hat, and burned all the hair off his left leg, I believe, as the lightning went down his left leg. Uh, it does strange things. That's another whole interesting story when you get into science, just studying some strange things lightning has done down through the years to people and people who survived it. And, of course, many haven't. Right here along the Gulf Coast in Pensacola, my understanding is we have more lightning strikes than any place else in the world. This is, this within a few hundred miles of here, is the lightning capital of the world, as I've heard that anyway. There is at least one or two people killed every year by lightning in this area. There was a kid killed in, I think it was Navarre or Pensacola or Beach or um, someplace along here a couple years ago. He's out there standing at, in the edge of the water in the ocean, and a bunch of his friends are swimming. Lightning came from about 20 miles away. Boom! Hit him on top of the head. Killed him. That was several years ago here on the, the Gulf Coast. Off track. Anyway, God said, can you send lightning? Now, what happened here, in these four chapters, God asked Job at least 84 questions by my count. Job never answered one. He asked him question after question. Maybe you can count see if you get a different number. You'll find it, it is a little difficult to count in some places. You know, is it one question or two questions? But God just asked Job question after question, and I'm convinced God was not looking for an answer. God was looking to change Job's attitude. These are the same kind of questions that sometimes dads have to ask their kids. Brother, you have four kids, right? Right? Four children? You know how it is. Sometimes kids get... You have three. Okay. I have three. One of each. Uh, kids get to a certain age, and they start to get kind of cocky, and they think, you know, they ought to make the rules around the house. Your son's probably not there yet, is he? To that point. Is he? Okay. The kid comes in one day and says, Hey, Dad, listen, uh, <clears throat> I believe I should be allowed to stay out till four in the morning with my friends. After all, I'm ten now. The dad says, hold on just a minute, kid. You'd like to know why you can't stay out till four in the morning. Well, son, let me ask you a few questions. Who pays the electric bill around this house? Who's paying for the house? Who's paying for the clothes you're wearing, son? Who pays for the food you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat? Who paid for the hot water and soap you took a shower with about a month ago? Let's just get it straight, son. The Bible is very clear. He who payeth the bills maketh the rules. Second Opinions, Chapter 4. You see, son, me, dad, <laughs> you, kid. And if you're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, you're going to do it my way. And when you want to do it your way, well, go get your own roof to sleep under and get your own food to eat, and you can do it your way. That's the golden rule, son. He that hath the gold maketh the rules. Second Opinions, Chapter 5. It's my favorite book in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> Put a lot of stuff in Second Opinions. Oh, Ben Franklin you know, had his own printing press. And it was hilarious. He would get into arguments with people about Scripture. And he, or any topic, it didn't matter what subject it was, he would argue with people, and he would say, well, it says in the Bible, you know, and he would make up something. And they would say, it does not say that in the Bible. He would say, yeah, it does, I'll prove it to you tomorrow. And he would go home and set up a page in his printing press to add a couple verses to the Bible. And then he'd print off that page and bring it in and show it to them. They said, well, boy, you're right. It sure does say that in the Bible. <laughs> Pretty nice having your own burning press, be able to control things. So I'm kidding about the second, second opinions, of course. Job chapter 40. God is still talking. How many chapters did God speak? How many chapters in the, is God speaking in this book? Four chapters, right. 38, 39, 40, and 41. In chapter 40, God is still talking. He said, Behold now, behemoth. Some people pronounce it behemoth. What is a behemoth, anyway? Well, many reference Bibles down through the years have tried to guess at what this animal is. The King James translators very wisely just simply called it behemoth. They did not know what it was. You've got to understand, this is in 1611. At this time, dinosaurs were mostly extinct. People had killed off nearly all of them calling them dragons. So they're killing off all the dragons, and most of them are gone. The population in the early 1600s began to grow because there was improving medicine, improving sanitation laws. Those are probably the two big things. 
that uh, incre increased uh, population. People live longer because they started obeying God's word about the common sense sanitation laws. There are scores of Old Testament regulations about washing your flesh and running water. If you touch a dead person, uh, you are unclean until evening. If you have leprosy, when you approach somebody, you put your hand over your upper lip and you cry, unclean, unclean. God didn't explain to the Jews about germs. They didn't have a microscope. But he told them, when you cover your upper lip, that way you can't breathe on somebody. This would have been an obvious indication that something about disease is airborne, can be transmitted through the air. If you touch a dead person, you wash in running water, not standing water. And it's also, the book of Leviticus is full of these sanitation laws, which if people would, I don't, we're not under the law, I understand that, but if you just obey the sanit common sense sanitary laws, we'd have much, many uh, diseases would disappear. And in the early 1300s, 1400s, 1200s, 1300s, people were dying. The death rate was incredible. There was one hospital that had a 100% mortality rate. Every baby that was born died for one year. You don't have to do that very long and your population starts to go away. <laughs> and they, the doctors were learning about anatomy. They would go in there, cut open a dead person, you know, and they're working on, oh, here's the heart, you know, and here's the liver. And he'd call and say, oh, Mrs. Jones is ready to have the baby, Doc. he said, okay, I'll be right there, you know. And he'd go in and deliver the baby without even washing his hands. Well, if the mother gets sick or dies, the baby dies, and they wonder, well, what's happening here? What did we do wrong? <laughs> well, idiot. When you touch a dead body, you wash your hands, what the Bible says. And so uh, one doctor, I forget his name now, was fired from his hospital because he insisted everybody that worked in his hospital wash their hands before surgery. So they fired him. Later, of course, it was proven, you know, the guy was right. To wash your hands. So slowly, in the early 1500s and 1600s, there, be, there began to be, number one, a great revival in interest in God's Word. And that quickly led to a revival in common sense sanitary practices, which led to people living longer, which led to a population growth. And if you look at the population growth curve in the seminar notebook, Everybody agrees, about the early 1600s, the population began to grow from about a half a billion total population in the world, and just 150 years later, there was one billion. It doubled in 150 years. Well, if it had been doubling every 150 years all through history, it would have been huge by then. But people weren't obeying God's word. Anyway, in 1611, the population was beginning to grow rapidly, King James Version was translated. There was a great increase in knowledge. Modern science really began because of a return to God's Word. People began saying, well, man, if, if God created the world, I wonder, I bet there's a reason for it. I bet there's some order to it. Maybe we can discover the order in nature. Because if there's a God, He's certainly orderly, and maybe there's a reason. And they began researching things like, you know, what is light? How fast does it travel anyway? How, how, how strong is gravity? Is there a gravitational relationship? And we came up with the inverse square law. And there are thousands of thousands of inventions of modern science because of a revival of interest in God's Word. This is the book that led the resurgence of modern science. And nearly all of the early scientists were creationists. And many, most of them Christians, God-fearing Christians. But just about without exception, they believed there was a creator and there's a reason, there's a design. One guy, uh, Murray, read the verse in the Bible where it says, The Lord, had had, there are paths in the seas. You mean there's a path in the, in the ocean? He thought, I wonder if there are paths in the seas. And so he devoted his life to studying ocean currents. You know, you drop a bottle in, see which way it floats. Study it, keep some records. And by studying the ocean currents, just because of that verse in the Bible that says there are paths in the seas, Murray developed our modern oceanography, where you study the ocean and see which way the current's going. And if you're going to sail from here to here, it might be quicker to go this way and follow the current. If your boat only goes 10 miles an hour anyway, if you can gain six more miles per hour by following the current, you cut two weeks off your transport time across the ocean. Even though it's a longer distance, it's faster because of the currents. And that was all directly because of God's Word. Anyway, here you got a rise in modern science in the early 1600s. And you, these guys, translators of King James Version, came across a problem. They came across several words. They did not know what they were. Because by the early 1600s, 
most dinosaurs were gone. A few are still alive, as we'll get into later, but mostly in remote parts of the world. The vast majority of the population had never heard of dinosaurs. Now, the bones weren't discovered and put together till when? When was the first dinosaur reassembled? 1809, right, the Iguanodon. As far as anybody can figure out, the first dinosaur put together for a museum was 1809 in England, the Iguanodon. So we got a time frame from when dinosaurs are nearly gone and the bones haven't been discovered and put together yet, and in the middle of that gap, King James Version is translated. So these King James translators are brilliant, man, the best guys you could have got for the job. One of the guys spoke 45 languages, one of the guys on the committee. Many of them, nearly all of them spoke more than 10 languages. When I was in Ukraine, uh, they told me, if you speak three languages, you are trilingual. If you speak two languages, you are bilingual. If you speak one language, you are American. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, sir, probably true. And I just barely speak the one, uh, English. But uh, you studied uh, other languages too, right, brother, besides which ones? Polish. Polish? German? German Ukrainian, uh, Russian, and now English. Ukrainian. Now it's a... And sign language. And sign language. Okay, good. Uh, during this time, they came across this word behemoth. Now, in 1600, you would be hard-pressed to find anybody that knew what dinosaurs were or had ever heard of dragons even. They weren't talked about much in the 1600s other than by then they equated them to some mythology. Uh, but even though people for the last th several thousand years had been seeing them and slaying them, and they were be becoming very rare. Even Beowulf in 588 slew what they thought was some of the last remaining dragons in their area. So here you got a thousand more years of dragons being extinct in most parts, certainly in the civilized parts of the world, they were gone. And so they came across the word behemoth and said, well, what is this anyway? Well, today, some reference Bibles say it might be an elephant or hippopotamus. No, it cannot be either of those from the description, as we'll see later. I think behemoth is the long-necked dinosaur, probably the Brachiosaurus. Now, there are 13, at least 13 different long-necked dinosaurs. The first one they put together for a museum, they named it the Brontosaurus. How many have ever heard of the Brontosaurus before? Fred Flintstone on the Flintstones, you know, drives a Brontosaurus, and they eat Bronto burgers and all that. The word Brontosaurus means thunder lizard. Because they, when they found these bones and put it together, they said, wow, when this thing walked, it would make the ground shake. You know, thunder lizard is what the name comes from. Most of the dinosaur names come from Latin, and they, they mean something. For instance, brontosaur, thunder, lizard. The word sor, S-A-U-R, is the suffix which means lizard, okay, reptile. Brachiosaurus means arm lizard. Brachio is Latin for arm, and brachiosaurus was named that because his front legs are longer than his back legs. A patosaur, I don't know what a patosaur means, you could look it up in a dictionary, but uh, what happened when they built the brontosaurus, they found all these bones and put them together, and they didn't have a head. They said, we can't put this thing in the museum with no head. We've got to put a head on it. Well, some guy brought a head from four, four, four and a half miles away and put it on the dinosaur, and they named it Brontosaurus. Years later, somebody noticed, hey, that's the wrong head. That head really goes on. I think the head was from an Apatosaurus, and the body was from a Diplodocus. It's not a big deal and nothing to get excited about, but it's sort of like if you're putting together a pile of dog bones and you're putting together a Chihuahua, and you don't have a head, so you put the head from a Great Dane on it. Well, they're both dog, but there's no such thing as a Great Chihuahua, okay? Uh, <laughs> they wouldn't go together. And this was, there's no such thing as a Brontosaurus, uh, but I, people still use that word, and it still appears in books all the time. That one, never, one of those never existed, but there were many just like that, okay? The Apatosaurus and the Diplodocus were mixed to make the Brontosaurus. But Job is probably describing, or God is probably to describing to Job a Brachiosaurus, it's my guess, for the arm lizard, because he apparently is the biggest one. And I tell people, of course, we have the Blondosaurus. You have to talk to her very slow. All right, Becky, see, I got this blonde hair too, I understand. Um, God said he eats grass as an ox. Now, because of the description of this animal in the next few verses, some people have tried to guess what it was. And some Bible scholars say it's an elephant or hippopotamus because elephants and hippos eat grass. Well, that's true. But you need to look at the next verse. His strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. The biggest part on him is his belly. Some people say, well, hey, elephants have a big belly. 
Yep, they sure do. Hippopotamus have a big belly. Mm -hmm. I've seen them. They got a big belly. Uh, Brachiosaurus has a big belly. Actually, he has a big belly. So that doesn't tell you which animal it is. A lot of animals have a big belly, and a lot of animals eat grass. So you look at the next verse. He moveth his tail like a cedar. Oh, now here we have a clue that would start eliminating other animals. His tail is like a cedar tree. Have you seen the tail of an elephant? Does that remind you of a cedar tree? Uh, no. How about the tail of a hippopotamus? Mm, that's not, not like a cedar tree either, right? <laughs> about that big, right? This has to be an animal with a huge tail like a tree, which would be the Brachiosaurus or an animal similar to that. Next verse says, His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He has big bones. And this is my uh, knuckle next to a Brachiosaurus toe bone, which I have in my suitcase I take on display when I go speak at churches. That's a toe bone. Now, I got this in Texas at uh, Glen Rose, Texas. Dr. Not Dr. Mr. Emmett McFall owned a large ranch, and the river that ran right through his property was the Paluxy River, where the dinosaur and human footprints are found. I took a busload of students over there back, oh, it would have been probably early 80s, 80, 81, maybe. We got to meet Emmett McFall before he died. He was an old man. And he had quite a few bones of dinosaur that he had found on his property. He had found, I think, just about the entire foot of a Brachiosaurus, they believe, or some, some large sauropod. And he was selling bone by bone. I said, how much do you want for one of those? He said, oh, for the little one there, you know, 20 bucks. I thought he was going to say 200. I still would have said yes. When he said 20, I said, okay, I'll take it. So I bought the toe bone off him for 20 bucks, and uh, I've had it ever since in, in, in my possession. But uh, we, we make castings of that if you want a copy out of real high-density foam or out of uh, um, the several different materials we can use to make castings. They cost more for certain things than others. You can call our ministry and see if you want a real toe bone to have. Uh, or a replica of a toe bone to have, for whatever reason, <clears throat> paperweight on your desk or something. We can make it out of hydra stone, and it looks and weighs just about the same as the original. If you make it out of the high-density foam, it looks just like the original, but it just doesn't weigh near as much for transporting around. This uh, is one of the second toe bones from the Brachiosaurus, uh, called a phalange. Now, this is uh, National Geographic, 1993. You can see the guy standing next to the foot and leg of a Brachiosaurus. I tell people the reason they had those big toe bones is because they had big toes. And you can barely see the toe bones on there, and each one is huge, and we have one of them. Here's a kid taking a bath in a footprint of a dinosaur from Glen Rose, Texas. They had a big, uh, had a big foot. And, of course, they had the big foot because they had a big leg to hold up. There's a man standing next to the front leg of a Brachiosaurus. So when the Bible says his bones are like bars of iron, that's a pretty accurate description. They had big, heavy-duty bones. The biggest one now was found in Oklahoma. As far as the tallest one, it's a New World's record. There's at least three records for dinosaurs. The tallest, the longest is another record, and the heaviest is a third record. And it's not all the same animal. The one in Oklahoma, they say, was 60 feet tall. The one, one they found in China, they said, would take them probably 60 years to dig out of the ground. It was, I think, 150 feet long, nose to tail. Half a football field. They say it probably weighed about 100 tons when it was alive, and 100 tons is equal to 14 standard-sized school buses put together. That means if he were to come by and step on you, you would be deeply impressed by him. You would be road pizza when he got done. Would you be depressed or impressed? Becky, you're the English expert, which is, you don't know. Find out for me. <laughs> the secretary's supposed to know all that stuff, aren't you? Um, this guy was big, okay? Um, this I, I tell folks you know, my, about my new invention that's going to save billions of dollars, you know, for highway department and construction crews, and I'm going to be the richest man in the world because of this new invention. I've invented a shovel that will stand up by itself. You won't need to pay those guys to lean on it anymore. That'll save money for the Marines, won't it, brother? You won't have to have all the guys standing around. <laughs> uh, Job 40, 19 says, He's the chief of the ways of God. Now, the Hebrew word resheth is translated beginning, chief, principal thing. He's the biggest animal God ever made. 
So this animal, behemoth, is Resheth. Resheth. I don't, didn't take Hebrew. I used to know a little Hebrew. He lived down the street, but he moved. Um, he's the chief. He's the biggest animal God made. That would have to be the Brachiosaurus. Or something like that. Maybe there's another one similar, bigger, Suprasaurus or something, but the same kind of animal. And you know, this fits the pattern for the way the devil works. Whenever God makes things, the devil tries to destroy them. God makes beautiful things and the devil tries to wreck them. For instance, God made music. God loves music. Carl Ball's got a neat book called Panorama of Creation. He thinks, and he goes through all the physics in there, and it's, I, don't know, I wouldn't preach it as doctrine, but it's very fascinating to study. He thinks when God first made the world, the canopy of ice or water overhead acted as a resonator so that, especially if it was super cold ice, he says the sound waves, the, the radio waves from the stars would hit this thing like a giant crystal, a tuner for a radio set, and cause it to put off a signal. So you could actually hear the music of the stars. I don't know if it's true, but it sure preaches good. All right? The Bible talks about the music of the stars. Interesting. God certainly made music. God made our ability to appreciate music. Nearly all of the birds have some kind of song. You know, some of them are pretty ugly in my opinion, but some of them are really pretty. A lot of the animals have certain uh, calls to each other. Whales, for instance, can call each other 100 miles away. Incredible. The whales will holler, you know, come home, honey, I'm sorry. You know, 100 miles away they can hear. <laughs> and the, the music, all of nature seems to have music to it which can all be reduced to mathematics and translates into colors, and that goes into a whole other long uh, session we'll get into some other time. But God likes music, apparently, from everything in nature seems to have musical patterns to it. And Satan has twisted it with ungodly music that does not glorify God. The Bible told us we're supposed to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I've had girls tell me, Oh, Brother Hovind, I, I like music. First thing I do when I go to church, I look for the hymns. No, you're getting the whole idea wrong. Uh, <laughs> you understand that, Steve? The hymns? The girls look for the hymns? Never mind. Explain that to him later, Becky. Uh, so you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And here we got all kinds of music that does not fit into this category. Some guy asked me one time, he said, Brother Hovind, do you know what you get if you play country music backwards? I said, No. He said, you get your hound dog, your wife, and your pickup all back. Oh, yeah, back masking. I heard about that. You know, this playing music backwards, and it's supposed to have a meaning to it. Anyway, God invented marriage and the family and sex. God made them male and female, and he understands it real well, and he put some rules down. Boys, you don't touch the girls until you're married to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I tell them, now, if you don't want to touch the girls, you stay away from me. I saw your kind in San Francisco. God put the rules down because he wants the very best for his creatures. The ideal situation is for a man and a woman who've never touched each other, get married as virgins, and live together for a lifetime. That's God's perfect plan. Anything other than that will cause some kind of problem somewhere along the line. There'll be distrust, there'll be arguing, there'll be fighting. Uh, it just it'll, it'll weaken the tremendous marriage bond that God intended people to have. And it's, God said, this is what I want you to do. The Bible says the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. How many people go from partner to partner to partner to partner, get married, you know, 20 times, or don't even get married, just live with them for a while, get sick, and go to another one? They're hunting for the precious life. The precious life is to do exactly what God said. You find the right one, you both get married as virgins, and you end up living together the next 75 years, and have, that's, the, that's the precious life. The adulteress is always hunting for that. And I would advise young people, even if you don't understand it, even if your friends aren't doing it God's way, you just read what this book says and do it. That's what I did. When I was 16, I got saved, and I was reading this Bible. And the Bible says, keep yourself pure from marriage. And all my friends, of course, are bragging about all their exploits. What about you, Hovind? I said, man, I'm going to wait for God's best. He said, you don't know what you're missing. Well, you're right, probably right. I'll find out. Now they're on their third wife and paying alimony all over the country and I'm still on my first, trying to train her. It's a little rough sometimes, but anyway. Uh, the adulteress hunts for the precious life. Precious life. Okay, the next verse, and we've got to quit here soon. The Bible says, God created great whales and every living creature. 
Now, this would indicate to me that God made the dinosaurs. Exodus 20.11 says God made everything in six days. So, that would mean dinosaurs also made in six days. Now, since God created the dinosaurs, Satan decided he would try to use dinosaurs to teach boys and girls a lie. And that's what we've seen in the last 150 years. Kids get books about dinosaurs. And the first sentence in the book says, anybody want to guess what it says? First sentence. Millions of years ago, right? So here we have Satan using God's creatures to teach kids a lie. Satan uses beautiful things that God makes and destroys them, and with them destroys hum humans, okay? How many people have been destroyed because of misuse of something God made? A lot. It's unreal, the things that happen, because we just don't obey that book. So God created dinosaurs. Now, the devil couldn't use dinosaurs to fool Adam. Suppose God would have come to Adam and said, Hey, did you know dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? Adam would say, What are you talking about, you idiot? I saw God make them. Read Genesis chapter 2. Adam saw God make some of the creatures. One of each creature. Now, the rest of the world's already full of animals. We get into that on uh, video number 7 about the supposed contradiction between chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis. There is no contradiction there. Adam actually saw God make one of each of the animals. The only person who did not get to see anything made was Eve. Guess who the devil came to to tempt? Eve. Adam had seen God do it. He knew what God could do. And you know, we've got a whole generation of young people today that have never seen God do anything in their life. Second-generation Christians often have a problem. Mom or dad get saved, and they see God just work miracles and change their life and make them you know, a whole new person. And then they have kids, and the kids get saved when they're four, five, six years old, you know, and they don't, ever, they don't ever see God do anything. Little David, when he was out there going to kill Goliath, Saul said, here, take my armor. David said, I can't take this armor. I've not proved it. We've got an awful lot of people who are running around in their parents' armor, and I would encourage young people everywhere, get your own armor. Get your, you know, you get close to God yourself. Don't rely on your parents' Christianity to keep you going. You get close to God and you ask God for things and you, you, you get your own armor. Uh, so, anyway, textbook says millions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth and kids are, being, are swallowing this up. Uh, this all started about 100 years ago. 1841, they made up the word dinosaur. 19, 1809, they found the first one and put it together, the Iguanodon. Some of those will be quiz questions. Um, the dinosaurs then became very popular in the early 1800s, mid-1800s. There were companies going out racing across the countryside trying to find dinosaurs. There was real competition. Some guy named Marsh and another guy, I forget his name now, they were they were, they, would, they were fighting each other over who gets the most dinosaurs, who gets the biggest dinosaurs, and bringing them back and putting them up in museums. The American Museum, the uh, Chicago Field Museum, the Smithsonian, they're putting up these huge dinosaur skeletons, and people are coming around from, from all over the world to see these, these massive dinosaur skeletons in the late 1800s. At the same time, people began teaching Darwin's theory. 1859, his book came out. And at the same time, they said, you know, the Earth is millions of years old, and these dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. So that all happened in the late 1800s, and for the last 120, 30, 40 years, kids have been taught dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and it's just not true. Are there any books like this in, uh, in our town? If you watch uh, TV, Nature Program, Discover, National Geographic, are you likely to hear something about millions of years ago? Sure you are. Millions of... Yes, last night. Everybody's being taught this, and that's why it's such a mission field. Last verse, and we'll quit here. The Bible says, He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The word fens means the swamp. So here the Bible is telling us, Behemoth lives in the swamp. Well, the biggest swamp in the world is in the middle of Africa. It's called the Likwala Swamp. It's 55,000 square miles. That's bigger than the entire state of Florida. Most Americans don't understand how big Africa is. There's what Africa looks like next to America. It's gigantic. There have been, uh, and by the way, that swamp is bigger than any one of those yellow states. It's the same size as any of the red ones. A swamp as big as Florida. 
The Congo government says the swamp is 80% unexplored and they own it. Imagine an area the size of Florida 80% unexplored. There have been reports of dinosaurs still alive in that swamp today, right now. We'll get into that in the next class. Dinosaurs still alive. Now, I don't want you to get excited and think you need to be careful when you leave this building because there might be a dinosaur out there. Uh, well, there are quite a few in our yard, but they're all fake. I'll just tell you right now, okay? So uh, we're going to cover next week dinosaurs that are still alive. That's been a fascinating study of mine for years called cryptozoology. We'll get into that next week. Thank you.